So hello everyone, welcome back to this week's Algebraic Graph Theory Seminar. This week we have Ivor Araujo. He's going to talk about the essential covers of the cube by hyperplans. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction and thank you the organizers for the invitation of speaking here. So today I'll be talking about essential covers of the cube by hyperplanes. So first I have to Two things I want to say. The first is I know this is an algebraic combinatorics seminar, but this is not an algebraic combinatorics problem. And I'm not from algebraic combinatorics, I'm from extremal combinatorics. So you can understand this more like an extremal combinatorics problem where there's some algebra involved. And actually, it turns out there's some geometry and some probability that will be involved in the proof too. Okay. And the second thing that I want to say that this will be an uh, interactive seminar, at least in the first part. So I'll be asking questions and I hope that someone answered. So at least one of you has to be awake during the seminar. Okay. So let's start with the first question. How many hyperplanes are needed to cover the vertices of the cube in any dimensions? So this is supposed to be a simple question, if you consider. Oops. A cube, how can we cover this cube using hyperplanes? Okay, so, the answer to this do they, have to question. Go, do they have to do they have to go through the origin? No, can be any hyperplane. Okay, so two then. Yes. So the answer is two are enough. And you can just take two parallel hyperplanes like that. Take this one, this one, and they all pass to our vertices. Okay. So only two are enough. So you can take these two parallel hyperplanes, the first variable equals zero, the this first variable equals one, and those two hyperplanes cover all vertices. But this is kind of a boring, uh, boring solution because you're actually only using one dimension. So in some sense, we're not interested in that kind of covering. We want to use the full n dimensions to use the hyperplanes. So for that, we change a little bit what the requirements of the hyperplanes. And here there are lots of different directions that one can take. Just one example of a famous problem, uh, Alum and Furedi in 93 consider if you cover all but one vertex of the cube. And that's a very famous paper. It's one of the papers that led to the finding of the combinatorial Nostellansatz. And, but we are dealing with a different thing. We want to cover all the vertices, but we want that all the variables appear. So by assuming that all variables x1 to xn are used in the equation of the hyperplanes, I mean that for each variable, there is at least one hyperplane that that variable appears in the equation of the hyperplane. So what we had before, isn't a valid construction anymore because I was only using X1. So how many planes are needed now? Okay, you can take some time to to realize, but actually we didn't change a lot because we can just take the covering that we had before and then we just add some plane that contains our variables. So for example, we have this x1 equals zero, x1 equals one, and then add the sum of all variables equals any number, take your favorite number. And this is also a covering and we're using all the variables. But in some sense, this isn't actually a covering using our variables because this last equation, it's not covering anything and it's not needed. We could just remove this 
this hyperplane and we're still covering. So in some sense, this hyperplane is redundant. So what happens if we assume that no hyperplane is redundant? So it turns out that now we actually have a question that's not trivial or not so easy. So let's see some small examples first. So let's see if you consider n equals two. So we want to cover the cube, this four vertices using lines. So how can we use cover with lines? The first thing that we cannot cover with just one line, we need at least two. And we want that the equation of those lines uses all the variables. So one way of doing that, we can just take the two diagonals. Okay, so here, this equation will be the sum equals one. And here will just be the two variables are equal. Okay, so in two dimensions with only two hyperplanes we can cover with hyperplanes and guaranteeing that every variable appear. But how about n equals three? Okay, so now it turns out that we cannot cover if using only two hyperplanes because every way that we can cover with two hyperplanes, the hyperplanes have to miss at least one of the variables. So in that case, we need at least three hyperplanes. And it turns out that we can actually cover using three hyperplanes. So let me give the example. We can just take one of the hyperplanes being just the x3 equals one. And then we can do something like take this hyperplane here. And then we are only missing these two vertices. So we can take one hyperplane that goes through here, for example. So those will be x1 minus x2 equals zero. And this last one will be the sum equals one. Okay. So in those initial cases, at least for n equals two, we need at least two hyperplanes. For n equals three, we need at least three hyperplanes. Um, are the examples clear? There's no question on the examples. I have a but, question. Um, yeah, sure. This last example, it's not unique, is it? Uh, there's other ways to do it with three for the three cube that still meet your constraints? Yes, it's not unique. Okay. Uh, for n equals two, I think it's basically unique. Uh, yes, for n equals two is unique, but for n equals three and in general, we see that there are a lot of different ways of Getting even you can like just change the, the coordinates. You see that those equations are not symmetric in right. all variables. So we can just change the variables and that will give, give a different sure. solution. Thanks. Okay, that's a good question. So let's define what we mean by that kind of covering. And that's exactly what defined to be an essential cover. So I just want to write the the formal definition so that we can get used with notation. So if you have some hyperplanes and for the talk every time that I say H1 to HK, I mean hyperplanes and they will be coming from uh, essential cover. So the hyperplanes are given by some equation that we want to think the equation as being something like this. We have a product of some coefficient, vector coefficients V sub I 
and x and is equal to some real number mu i. Okay. And the conditions are exactly the conditions we had before. Number one says that we uh, have a covering. So for every vertex of the cube, there is some hyperplane that covers it. Number two says that for every variable, there is some hyperplane that contains that variable, which means that the coefficient of the hyperplane, the i hyperplane on that j variable is non-zero. And the third says that we don't have any redundant hyperplane. So for every hyperplane, if you remove that hyperplane, there will be a vertex that will be uncovered. So for every hyperplane, there is some vertex that is only covered by that hyperplane. Okay, so that's the definition of essential covers. I want to start to think now about the vector of coefficients and it will turn out that an uh, easy way for the proofs is to think as this matrix of coefficients. So given an essential cover, we consider this matrix which have in each row the coefficients of the hyperplane and the proof will basically analyze what the properties of this K by N matrix. And from there, we're trying to prove some lower bounds on the number of planes, okay? So the question we had before is exactly this one that was introduced and asked by Linio and Hadakrishnan in 2005. So what's the minimal number of hyperplanes that we need to have in an essential cover of the cube? So if this number is E of n, then what they show is that we can get a essential cover with this n over two plus one. And what they actually prove is that there's an inductive way of getting this. So what this lemma is saying that, imagine that we have an essential cover for some dimension n, and we also have a essential cover for some other dimension m then we can get a essential cover for dimension n plus m, but just combining the two essential covers. So how we combine? For the first hyperplane each cover, we just take the sum of the two equations and then we repeat all the rest of the equations. And by the sum of the equations, I mean that we consider that the set of variables is distinct, it is disjoint for the two coverings. So we consider that we have some x1 to xn for the first covering. We have some y1 to ym for the second covering. And then we just sum the two equations where the variables are all different. Okay. So let's just see what we get. For example, when n equals m equals two, what we had before is that this is a covering. We have x1 minus x2 equals zero and x1 plus x2 equals one. So we saw that this was an essential cover in the two dimension case. So we have that this is also a covering. one. So what's the lemma is saying is that if you take the first and sum and then repeat the two others, we get an essential cover in the four dimensional hyper, hyper cube. Okay. And notes that we can, we can order the cover however you want. So this summing the first two it depends on which we take as the first or the second. So we could also get, for example, this, if we sum different ones. So if you take the x1 plus x2 equals one as the first one in both, when the sum the two, we have this, the sum of the four variables equals two, and we also have x1 equals x2 and x3 equals x4. So if this, we get a covering, of the four dimension cube, okay? And if we keep repeating this procedure, we can take now this covering of the four dimension cube 
combined with the covering of the two dimension cube and get a covering of the six dimension cube. So we get a covering for every even number. And it turns out that the cover that we get is this one. We, we can immediately see that it's a covering because we have those equations, x to i minus one equals x to y. So the only vertices that those equations don't cover are the ones that one of them is zero and the other of the other is one. So the only vertices that are not covered with this are vertices that if you sum all the variables, we'll get exactly n over two. Because we are pairing all the variables, one of them is zero, the other one is one. So when we sum all them together, they have to be n over two. So those n over two plus one hyperplanes, they cover the whole cube. We are using our variables and all the hyperplanes, are, no hyperplane here is redundant. Okay. So if you want a covering for odd n, we can just use the covering that we had before for the three dimension and we get a covering. So if you want to add one variable, you can simply add the new variable x n plus one here. And then you consider one more hyperplane, say x n plus one equals one. Okay, so we are changing one of the equations and add one new hyperplane. Now we are using all the variables, we're still covering the cube and by the same reason before we are covering the cube. So with this, we have a covering with n over two plus one. Okay, but I could just simply said what the example is. So why did I want to say that we have this inductive construction? It's because we actually can find a lot of different coverings using this inductive construction if we consider a different hyperplane to be the first one in the list, okay? And this is very important because we actually believe that this equation should hold with equality for every single n. So we believe that for every n, this E of n should be equal to the ceiling of n over two plus one. So somehow studying all of those different coverings that you can find using this lemma can be helpful to try to prove lower bounds. And this is one of the difficulties in trying to prove a matching lower bound. It's because the coverings that we could be doing with that are very different from one another. since we're talking about lower bounds. So in the same paper, Nino and Hara Krishnan, they gave one lower bound, but the lower bound is much far off, just square root of n. And here this lower bound works for every n, but we somehow are interested in the asymptotics. And for a long time, there are no improvement on this bound of square root of n they are stopped at this function until recently Yehuda and Yehudayov, they proved this lower bound that actually this number has to be at least n to the 0 0.52. At least if you see their paper, that's what they claim. And you might wonder where this 0.52 comes from. And if you follow their proof, what they actually are proving with the method, what they can prove is this n to the 12 over 23, which is roughly 0.52. But in their proof, instead of writing the constants that they give, they just put some numeric approximation for every single constant during the proof. And in the end, they just show how to get the 0.52, which is a big thing because you can see that for a long time, no one could improve the square root of n. And actually they need to introduce a lot of new ideas to get this small improvement. So what we'll be talking today will mainly the ideas in this proof of Yehudi and Yehudayov and how we, uh, my advisor, Yors Balog and Leticia Matos, we could improve a little bit. So we show that any essential cover of the cube by hyperplanes contains at least this n to the five over nine hyperplanes with some log correction. 
So just for a comparison here, the exponent of n it's five over nine, which is like 0 0.555, where, where the proof of Yehuda and Yehuda of get 0 0.52. Okay, so we're still very far from what we believe is the truth, which will be like n over two, but we have some significant improvement. Okay. I think I'll stop now for questions. If we have no questions, I will move on to the to show some of the tools that are in the proof. Actually, the first thing I want to show is this square root of n bound from Linio and Hare Krishna. So what they use is that they use some lemma in polynomial algebra. So you don't need to read the lemma right now. The important thing that has this consequence that whenever we have an essential cover, when you look the support, which means the coefficients that are non-zero in the hyperplane, we have that the size of the support of the vector has to be bounded. So if the number of hyperplanes is k, then when you look at the number of variables that are used in a plane, you can use at most two times k minus one. So this is kind of a weird thing, because if you remember that we expected the optimal cover will have n over two plus one. So this is just saying that we can use at most other variables in that case. But when you're trying to prove some lower bound, which is far off from the truth, like square root of n, this is actually giving a lot. It's saying that we can use at most square root of n variables in every single plane, okay? So let me show how this follows quickly from the lemma. So the lemma says that if you have, if you are in this quotient ring, that we basically are quotient by polynomials that are zero exactly in the vertices of the cube. If you have some product of polynomials that is zero and one of the polynomials is linear and the other then the other polynomial has to have degree at least the number of variables of that polynomial over two, okay? So that's not a very hard lemma to prove. The proof of it is like a page or I think less than a page. You can go to the paper from Linear and Hadar Krishna to see the proof. But the main thing is how from this we get the, the bound on the support of the vectors that we had before. So you can then simply take P, this polynomial P of X as being the equation of one hyperplane. So let's say it's like this, we have P sub I in a product with X minus mu of I, which was the equation of one hyperplane. And we take Q to be the product of the equations of every other plane. So for every J and T equals to Y, we have this in a product. Okay, so what happens if you take this P, P times Q, this is zero in the whole cube because we have a covering. So indeed we have the PQ is zero in this quotient ring. Okay, P is just a linear polynomial and the number of variables that we have in this polynomial, which is the L in the lemma, is exactly the size of the support of the vector. Okay, and if you see this Q, what's the degree of Q? The degree of Q is exactly the number of hyperplanes that we are using this product. So if you have K hyperplanes before, then the degree of Q has to be K minus one. So what the lemma is saying is that K minus one has to be at least the size of the support over two. 
which is exactly what we had before that the size of support is bounded by two times k minus one. Okay. So it's in, indeed a direct consequence. Okay. But now we have something is like weird happening. First of all, let's just prove that with this we can actually show the square root of n bound. So we can just simply count the number of non-zero coefficients in total. Okay, so we have k equations and for each of them, the number of non-zero coefficients is at most two times k minus one. Okay, so we have this upper bound on the number of non-zero coefficients. And for the other side, for every single variable, we need at least one hyperplane to be non-zero for that variable. So we have a lower bound of n. Okay, so if you solve this equation, we get exactly the k has to be at least square root of n with some constant in front. So what linear and Hedekushin prove, it's actually with the definition of essential covers, we have then not only one hyperplane has to be non-zero for a variable, but every variable has to appear in at least two equations of hyperplanes. So it has to be at least two n, and that's how they get exactly this equation with these concepts. Okay. So now there's something weird happening because we know that the support of every, the support of every hyperplane has to be small, but at the same time, we have this result from probability, which is called the little offer lemma, that if you have some vector that has a big support, which means that we have a lot of variables appearing, a lot of non-zero coefficients, then this hyperplane can cover just a small proportion of the hypercube. So you can see that when you have like sum of variables equals some number. This will be maximized when you have like this equals n over two, and this is covering only n choose n over two variables, which is roughly two to the n over square root of n with some constant. But the thing is, we are covering just a one over square root of n proportion of the whole group. So, if the support has, if the support is big, it is large, then we're not covering a lot. So in some sense, we don't want to have those equations that have big support, or at least we don't want to have a lot of equations have big support. But at the same time, if have most of the equations have small support, we can use some similar ideas before and give a bound just by counting the number of non-zero coefficients. Okay, so in the same paper, linear had a question and just showed that we can try to use this, but if you just use this, we actually get a weaker lower bound of n to the one third. And here comes the ideas of Yehuda and Yehudayof, is that basically this little offer lemma, it's best used when all the coefficients of this vector v are the same. So I was, I had before I had the sum of the variables. So all the coefficients are or equal to one. But when the coefficients are very different, then actually we cannot do as good as one of the square root of the support. For example, if you have an equation like this, where the coefficients are growing exponentially, then it doesn't matter which number I put in the right side here. If you remember that every number has a unique representation in, in base two, then there'll be only one solution. So hyperplanes like this can only cover one vertex of the cube. Okay. So the idea of Yehudin Yehudayof, it's go further, not only look at the support 
but also see if the coefficients of the planes are very different and you have this exponential increase or exponential decay, then you actually are curving much lower than this little Doppler lemma is saying. And that's when they define this vector of main scales. So similar to have to what we had before, this vector of main scales just saying when we have this exponential increase. So we say that a vector has S scales when you can partition the, the coordinates of the vector in S parts, so that if you look at the L2 norm of each part, it's increasing by a constant factor. Okay, so we have this vector. We can somehow partition in S part. And when you look the coefficients of one part, they're much smaller than the coefficients in the next part. So we have something similar to before that we actually need to cover much fewer vertices than this one of the square root of the support. Okay. And that can be made precise in this anti-concentration lemma that says that we have some anti-concentration not only for a single vertex as we had before, but we can even get more for any interval that we get when we are scaling the interval with this the smallest L2 norm that we had before, which is this delta, then we are covering exponentially small many vertices of the cube. Okay, so you can think that if the number of scales here S is something like log n or a big constant times log n, then here we have something that's small enough that we can union bound over all hyperplanes. So in some sense, those vectors that have log n many scales, they are not covering many vertices of the cube. Okay. So it would be good for us if we can find a lot of those vectors in our essential cover that have log n many scales. Because then they cannot cover a lot. So either we have a lot of those vectors or the rest of the vectors have to cover the whole, whole cube, basically. Okay, and then comes this idea of a matrix decomposition. So as I said before, we can consider this matrix, which is the matrix of the coefficients. So what we can do with this matrix, you can note that this matrix will be basically the same. We can switch rows or switch columns, will just be like a change of variables or a change of the order of the list of hyperplanes. So we can, try to reorder the rows and columns in a way that we can split what are those vectors with many scales, meaning that have log, man, log n many scales, and what are the vectors that don't, what the vectors that have like a lot of zeros, uh, have small support, the vectors that have big support, and so on. So they give this grid algorithm that can split a matrix in this form. So basically we have some vectors that have a lot of zeros. So this whole thing here is a bunch of zeros. Here we have the support is big enough. So we can use a union bound for those vectors. We have some vectors here that have many scales, meaning that have log n many scales. So again, we can use a union bound just with the anti-concentration lemma that they had before. And then what's left over in this decomposition is this part here of the matrix where we have this property. If you rescale the coefficients so that every norm, every row has L2 norm one, then when you look at the column, the L2 norm of the column is bounded by this W, which we take n to the one over nine in, in our proof. So you can think that here we have some vectors that have to cover a large subcube. And that we also know that if you rescale, so the norm of every row is one, then the norm of the column has to be bounded by something very small. Okay. And now the question is how do we deal with those vectors? 
and now is when geometry comes into play. So there is this lemma from Bang, which was, it's from the solution of the Tarski Bank problem, if that's familiar to anyone. And there's this problem in convex geometry. And this lemma from Bang is basically saying that if you have a lot of hyperplanes, you can find a point that's far away from each of the hyperplanes. So what it gives us is that we can find a point. Okay, you want to be a vertex of the cube, but if you have a lot of hyperplanes, we can find some vertex inside the cube, somewhere inside the cube that's far from all the hyperplanes. So what's the idea? We use the vertex that we know that exists by the lemma, and we give a probability distribution that the sample of vertex of the cube one of the vertices, but this probability distribution will be centered at this vertex. So we consider all the different coordinates to be independent, but we want the mean of this random variable to be exactly in this point. And because this point is far from every hyperplane, then we'll be able to show that it's very unlikely to when we sample with this probability distribution, would be very unlikely to be in one hyperplane. Okay. So formally, what to prove is this lemma. And here is where we have a big improvement compared to the Yehuda and Yehuda Hidayov bound. They use basically the same method, but here they have some weaker dependence on the constants. And here we optimize what the bank lemma can can give us. So what we have is, if I have a matrix, uh, L by M matrix, and we know that the L2 norm of every row is one, and we have some bound on the size of the support for every column that I'm calling alpha, and I have some bound on the norm of every column that I'm calling beta. So as long as this equation is satisfied, two alpha beta times log of four L, where here L is the number of rows. So the number of equations, the number of hyperplanes. Then it doesn't matter what the coefficients on the right-hand side of the equations are. Those hyperplanes cannot cover the whole cube. Okay. So this equation is basically telling us that we can use the union bound when you just look at the probabilities that you obtain using Bang's lemma, okay? So that's basically the whole idea of the proof. So let's just overview how the proof goes. First, we view the essential cover as a matrix system. So we look at this matrix of coefficients. We have this lemma from polynomial algebra that's from linear and Krishna that says the support, the size of the support of each row has to be small, meaning at most two times the number of planes. So we explore the fact that we have the offer lemma and actually can get a much stronger concentration when the vectors have a much different coefficients. So when you have this exponential decay, the coefficients, meaning the vectors with many scales. So we decompose the matrix in some grid way so that we can use those factors, the, the size of the support and the vectors with many scales. And we end up with those leftovers, which are some vectors with have some small column norm. So we use Bang's lemma to show that they, those hyperplanes that have small color norm, they cannot cover many vertices. And that would be a contradiction because in the beginning we assume that we, we have less than this n to the five over nine planes. So when we get to this final step, we don't have enough factors to cover this whole subcube that has to be covered by those planes. So what's left of the work to do and how can someone try to 
actually give a matching lower bound. So there's this paper by David Saxon that he considers not only those essential covers, but with the further restriction that all the coefficients has to be non-negative. And he proves that in that case, the number of hyperplanes needed is n plus one. And he also gives a matching lower bound. So the minimum number is exactly equal to n plus one. In the same, the way that he does that is proving some permanent lemma that's similar to this one, but for those matrix we have no negative entries. And he also mentioned that there's this conjecture that will all not only prove that the minimal number of hyperplanes needed in the essential cover is exactly n over two plus one, but also have some consequences in another it will also prove another conjectures in combinatorics. So it might not seem but that's a very strong statement. Yeah. It says that for every matrix that we have, as long as we have this house type condition, that for every set, when you look at the non-zero elements on these rows, then the number of columns that we are seeing with the non-zero elements is at least twice as many. Uh, twice minus one. Then that would imply that we can find a submatrix which has non-zero permanent. Okay, so the same result if we for assume that the other entries of the matrix are non-negative, then it's A's result. And that's how Saxon proves the case when the essential cover has only no negative elements, but here it's much harder when we can have some negative coefficients too. Okay. So that's one idea of actually proving a matching lower bound, trying to prove this conjecture directly, but I would think that's much harder. So another idea is to improve the dependence of constant on the this final proposition. As I said, this is the optimal thing if you try to union bound using Banks lemma. But there's no reason to believe that this dependence of constant is the best possible dependence of constant for this proposition to be true. So someone can try to come up with a completely different proof or a clever use of Banks lemma not using union bound in the end and getting a better dependence. And if you get a better dependence here, you get some improvement in the lower bound. So I think that will be my guess or how to improve a little bit the lower bound, try to improve this proposition. And the other idea is to try to find and explore some other property because we are relying on this fact that the vectors of the essential cover, they have some bounded support. But as I said, this is not giving anything if you're trying to prove a matching lower bound. So with just this, we cannot prove a match lower bound. So we can try to find and explore some other property, some algebraic property that every essential cover has to have. And maybe if that other property together with bound support, we can improve the lower bound too. So, Uh, so, is there any question for Igor? Sure. Um, do you know up to what point we have the exam like the lower bound is? If the conjecture lower bound is tight, like for small n. Um, do you mean when we know that the n over two plus one is correct? Right, yeah. So I know the first small cases we know up to five for sure. Um, I don't know if we know for six dimensions or not. Uh, 
Oh, actually, for six dimensions, you know. So I think the first like open it's seven dimensions, but I could be wrong. Interesting. Yeah, I think like the main interest is in the asymptotics, not in the small cases. Of course. So I don't think there's any like paper that actually shows the small cases, but mm -hmm. I believe that up to six is easy to prove. And for seven, I don't know if it is or not. Thanks.